Thank you so much. Um, that's an old running joke with me. I loved, you know, back in the days when the flight attendants acted it out with their hands and they always used two fingers. Yeah, see, Paul wanted to, see, he wanted to do it too. Now they put it all on video. It's not, it's not the same. But anyway, I always laugh because I always say um, I raise children. So I just want to point and have people listen and have to obey. But I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> it's just fun. So um, I always uh, get so excited about ministering. And this morning I have a lot to get in. And so I am a little bit raring to go. We're continuing our series on the Holy Spirit, and it's so exciting because it just, we know that God is infusing something into our church of just the presence of God, and there's just something going on. And how many of you have lived long enough with the Lord to figure out you don't have to figure it all out? When something's going on, just jump in. However, God does impart understanding. We were driving to church, and Paul told me a saying that someone said, um, what was that? God didn't like thinkers, just drinkers. And he meant God's not looking for thinkers. He's looking for drinkers. And he meant drinking the Holy Spirit, right? So get out of your head and get. But I just am here to proclaim to you God can do both. And your brain was given to you for spirit-anointed thinking. So it's not that God wants you to stop thinking. He wants you to attach that brain to the right source, which is his spirit. So there's a whole lot in the Bible to say about being a thinker of the right kind so you can drink and think if you want to go with that. So we're going to just dive right in. This is the Holy Spirit. My title today, some of you it'll make you wonder. Some of you will already know where I'm going Either way, I'm not going to explain it. You're going to get the explanation in the message. The Holy Spirit, dove or wild goose? So, well, I'll, you'll understand that in a minute. I was reminded this week of the importance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I thought about David. When David wrote Psalm 51, it was the lowest time in his life. He'd let God down the most. He had basically committed murder to get another woman and uh, that's not the behavior you would attribute to a man who's described as a man after God's own heart, which he was. And so Psalm 51 is his prayer of repentance. And look at what he says. And right in the middle of it, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't get a lot of mentions in the Old Testament other than coming on the prophets or on people. Because Jesus told us in the New Testament, he will be with you and in you. But in the Old Testament, he was active in the corporate group, but he wasn't inside people. And that's why he doesn't get mentioned enough. But here David knew somehow, if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I can't live this life. And we are just the same, but we have him in us. Can I tell you, he won't do that. He won't cast you away from his presence or take his Holy Spirit from you. But the flip side of that message is how much we need him. Because it's just concept if, it's, if the Holy Spirit's not making it real in our lives. And that's how everything just goes awry is Christianity becomes just concept and a moral code. And my friends, it is not that. It's a life. It's a life received. So... Remember two weeks ago, we also said the Lord gave us a word as a church. It's time to make deep peace with some things about yourself. You know, I believe without God and with some good counseling, you can make peace about some things about the way you're wired. But I believe it takes the Holy Spirit to make deep peace. Because when you get shown by him, hey, the Father made you this way and here's the purpose of it. Then you get to unhook it from all the wrong expressions. Anybody, anybody lived this? You get to unhook it. God's not trying to kill you. He's trying to fill you. He killed everything that would hinder the real you at the cross. And he's just trying to manifest that. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Also two weeks ago, you'll remember... We talked about the work of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit's role in creation. I'm not going to repeat all that, but I had this slide up there. 
And the point I made over here was Genesis 1-2 talks about how the Holy Spirit worked in creation. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was doing an interesting thing. He was hovering over the waters. And the Hebrew word means fluttering. It's the same word used in Deuteronomy describing a mother eagle fluttering over her nest. So there's, do you know, even in Matthew, I believe it's uh, Matthew 28, it talks about how uh, God knows even when a sparrow falls. Two sparrows are sold for a penny, but God knows when every one of them falls. There's something about these vibrations of wings that God senses and gets. In fact, I think heaven is built on a lot of frequencies and wavelengths. I think heaven is a place of a dynamism, a movement, and I think even there's something about the way the Holy Spirit was preparing to participate in creation that there were like wings fluttering. There was an expectancy. And so that's the description of what he was doing at the first creation. But another place we see the Trinity in glorious creative cooperation is at the new creation, or the onset of it, the inauguration of it, a scene from Genesis, the scene we just talked about from Genesis 1, is revisited when Jesus is baptized. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and suddenly the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It doesn't say in a dove, says, like a dove, and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So here's the new creation. We just looked at the first creation. And again, we can see all the members of the Trinity active. Jesus, the Logos, Jesus is the word made flesh, and he was baptized. The Father speaks from heaven identity and approval you know he what that's what he wants to do for all of us he wants to speak identity and approval over you too because we are in Christ we have access to all of these activities of the Trinity but then here the Holy Spirit shows up as an and I called it an avian appearing interruption from another realm he showed up like a dove so I think it's comical and I hope you do too okay do y'all like this jacket I didn't think I, that my son gave me that, and it completed the outfit, so I'm going to finish this in an incomplete outfit. But here we go. Uh, it's almost comical to me when I look at artists trying to express these supernatural things in the Old Testament. So you know, you've all probably all heard the story of, you know, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. So we have a children's uh, illustration here, which basically has the dove sitting on Jesus' head, and one does wonder if he poops there. <laughs> and then we have the top one where they went the whole other direction, and so it does look like a painting from the 1950s that's found in a very religious place, right? This one is, of them all, I think this is my favorite, because when it says in the form of a dove, I don't think he's implying a bunch of doves. I think he's implying that there was so much movement going on that you almost couldn't get a still shot of it. That sounds like the Holy Spirit hovering or fluttering, doesn't it? And I like that one the most. Um, but there's, yeah, again, there's something about that that we, it's an amazing thing that he descended in the form of what was best described by the writer as a dove. There's another place in the Old Testament that you'll remember that a dove has some symbolism uh, Genesis 8, Noah sends out the dove to find dry land. The story uh, tells that he sent out a bird three times. First time it comes back with no sign of the waters receding. Second time, the dove returns with an olive leaf because he's looking for dry land. Comes, can't find dry land, comes back. Second time, comes back with an olive branch. Third time, what happens? He doesn't come back. So that's when Noah knows that dry land has been found. 
And it's reminiscent of Psalm 55, 6, where David prayed, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. And don't we associate the dove image of the Holy Spirit with rest? The Holy Spirit really does give us rest, and the olive branch symbolizes peace. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, It's not exactly a, a picture of the Holy Spirit, but it has similar elements of water baptism and fresh promises and a bird at the center of the story. Here's something that's fascinating. Lynn Howells, our friend, said this. As Jesus emerged from the waters of baptism, what we just read about, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, landed on him. It was also a dove that Noah released from the ark, searching for the new world. The dove found the new world and the new creation in Christ. The kingdom of heaven was invading the earth. It was at hand. Peter used the story of Noah to declare that our baptism is our resurrection into God's new world, and as citizens, we are to colonize this world with heaven's government as the dove rests on us too. Isn't that beautiful? So we end up with a bunch of stuff that looks like this. How many of you have seen religious depictions of the dove as the Holy Spirit, especially if you're my age? You would have lived through the 70s. I think I sold that piece of jewelry in the store that was called The Love Shop at Hewland Mall, which was, at that moment, a trendy name for a Christian bookshop. Not so much probably now. But, you know, even with these depictions of this dove, can can you see why he's the least understood member of the Trinity? Because we have a stained glass window with a, interesting looking dove compared to the Holy Spirit, that ought to make you scratch your head. But what I wanted you to notice from this slide is even that last one, it's almost like there's these two drives. There's one drive to tame the dove, and then there's somebody else over here going, yeah, but there's got to be some fire. And so this one artist added these flames because just even intuitively, we know there is this gentleness of the Holy Spirit, but man, he can also disrupt Has anybody known him that way? Listen, he doesn't compromise who he is on one side or the other. He's both and. We're learning this more and more at the Abbey that God is in the both and, not the either or. Okay, so the dove. The Celtic Christians, however, whoops, the Celtic Christians had an additional symbol for the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know about the history of, of Christianity in Europe, the Celts were this ancient warlike people that were there from the Iron Age, and they were fierce, and they were nature worshipers, and they were uh, colorful and wild and nomadic, and they were just uncontrollable, really. In fact, the Romans, the Roman Empire was a little afraid of them, and they weren't afraid of much. Too barbaric for the Romans. That's why Hadrian's Wall was built halfway up Scotland, and also Ireland was never conquered by Rome because they thought, yeah, we're not doing that. So that tells you a lot about the Celtic people. Now, when people like Patrick evangelized the Celtic people, and Patrick, if if you're interested in missions, everybody interested in evangelism and missions should study Patrick because he did an amazing thing. Patrick was a Roman living in Britain, conquered by the, Britain conquered by the Roman Empire. He was raised Christian, but he wasn't really. He was just nominally Christian in the church of the time. And he was captured by Irish slave traders who were mean and ruthless. He was a young man. He was carried away to Ireland. He served under them pagan, completely pagan, Celtic pagans. He escaped, and nobody escaped. He escaped, well... He started praying because he was raised around prayer. He just hadn't done any. And so while he's captured, he starts praying, and he hears a voice saying, go down to the sea at this certain place, and a ship will take you home. He does it. It happens. He's home safe in Britain. Escape. No one escapes. So he knows God's real. He spends time in the woods, kind of like David in the Psalms. He gets to know God. Then he's been home a while, and he hears a voice say, He's, he, in a dream, he sees the Irish people rise up as one person and say, 
come back to us and teach us the things of God. And so he trains for the ministry. He doesn't even finish the training. They want him to stay longer and be more trained. He's like, can't do that. Got a job to do. So he starts. He goes back and, and literally never has one man evangelized so much. He evangelized all of Ireland. They didn't read. He taught them to read so they could read the scriptures. But guess what he did? Instead of squelching all their color and life, he connected with it and redeemed it. Instead of going, now please, now we need you to act like me, act like the Romans, act Roman, be Roman. Be. He saw the God potential in who the Celtic Irish people were and he set it free. He set free the color. He set free the art. They even had things in their folklore. They would do these well-dressing ceremonies because water is important in an agrarian economy. So they would, they would have these pagan rituals where they tried to get their well to not dry up that were dedicated to nymphs and the sun god and fairies. And, you know, Patrick and the Christians that he produced redeemed those and made those about John 7, about the well of living water, made it like the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, red scripture that applied to rivers of living water. Everywhere he could, he redeemed everything in those people. But here's a great, a great quote about the... This was in the sixth, fifth and sixth centuries this was happening. The Roman church was unsure how to respond to these Celtic Christians because they were relational rather than rational and inspirational rather than institutional. How fun is that? I mean, no wonder people are excited about Celtic Christianity when they learn about it. They were converted but not tamed. They stayed wild. Then they just went ahead in their spare time and evangelized all of Europe. Yeah, they did. They sent out missionaries to the rest of Europe. In fact, the, the uh, abbey or church or monastery, not even sure, was it a monastery Martin Luther was at? When he got his revelation of grace and nailed the 95 Theses, that was founded from this movement. Because they evangelized Europe. They went and evangelized the rest of the world. In one word, they were non-dualistic. They saw life as one big circle not a series of judgments where we split it apart. So here's a Celtic cross in the middle and tells you a little bit. But listen, this is fascinating. The Celtic cross existed before Christianity in their art because it, the origins are sketchy, but the one general consensus is it represented the meeting place of divine energies and was a symbolic compass offering spiritual navigation. How many of you think that's a pretty good cross to redeem by the real cross of Jesus Christ? How beautiful is that? So you can either look at that and go, that's a pagan symbol. Or you can look at that and go, God is so big that he left that ready for Patrick. And Patrick was the one, again, who did it. He walked in and went, ha, ah, tell you about the real cross. That circle, some people said the circle meant the sun because they worshiped the sun. But can't that circle also represent that Jesus redeems in every degree of eternity and his redemption is ongoing? There's never been a better example of engaging the culture than what happened with Christianity. This is, they, the other thing they did is when they learned to read, they did these illuminated manuscripts. So this is a page. This is Christ enthroned. This is Celtic art. You might have seen it. This is from the book of Kells that was produced in 800 AD in Ireland or maybe in, on Iona, which is Scotland. This is from the book of Lindisfarne, or the Lindisfarne Gospels. And that was produced, that's the first page of the book of Matthew. And you know what they did? On purpose, can you see all that knot work? It's very fractal-esque. On purpose, on every page, they would leave one part imperfect, on purpose. Because they always wanted to remember that in all their creativity, only God was perfect. They had all kinds of little things. I'll tell you one more real quick. They, had a, they loved the Trinity so much. They were passionate about anything in threes. You've heard Patrick preached off the shamrock, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three but one. They also, instead of picking one core value for their life, they believed in having three. 
So all the Celtic saints would hone down to three things that they were called to produce, which is actually, if you think of Micah 6, 8, you know that scripture says, he has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. How many is that? So there's something beautiful about these Celtic saints would list, you know, three things that they stood for their whole life. Do you know it's interesting, of the records surviving, no three were the same between any two of these great Celtic evangelists, which just shows you that they had personal relationships with God. This is not to say what a great people in history. This is to say this is what the kingdom does to people. We are those people. We just need to come more fully alive to it. We are the same kingdom people because it's not about the Celts. It's about the kingdom. They saw no boundaries between the sacred and the secular. They were open to Eastern mindsets. They had a sense of God as a continuing, personal, helpful presence. That's what Paul preached all last week. Uh, They developed the idea of a soul friend or a journey mate who walks with you and you share your development with them. Uh, Women had more footing in the Celtic church. Women were allowed to be leaders. Many, many more things, and I just told you about the three things that that fascinates me. So, now that I've told you that much, it should not be a surprise to you that their symbol of for the Holy Spirit was not so much the dove, but the wild goose. The wild goose became a Celtic Christian symbol of the Holy Spirit. And just in your mind, doesn't that sound raw and real? Listen, it said like a dove. It didn't say he was a dove. Nothing said define your Holy Spirit by a dove. That was like a dove. The Celts said, you know what? The way people look at doves, we think we've gotten to know him as something wilder than that. And a dove, don't they coo and it's restful? Have you heard a dove coo? I think I hear doves cooing. But geese aren't restful, are they? They squawk, and they swoop in, and also at the park, I think they're scary. Have y'all seen mean geese at the park? When we were at, we were at the Isle of Iona, uh, t- Paul and I, early, many, I mean, I don't know, maybe 20, almost 20 years ago, and uh, it was gale force winds the day we visited, which is just what you want for your Celtic pilgrimage, because it was like, I mean, we literally were being blown backwards all day long. And I remember taking the ferry over to the Isle of Iona, which there's an amazing monastery where all of these Celtic spots, signs, wonders, miracles are recorded. They just got woven into the stuff of legend. So now they sound like, and oh, then the dragon walked out. But (laughs) underneath it all, there are records of genuine healings, genuine miracles, genuine interventions, angels appearing, the real thing. So... We're riding over there on this, uh, we're riding to Iona from the island of Mole in gale force winds, the, the ferries, you know, like this. And there's geese in the water trying to swim. And I, the wild geese were getting pulled under and popping right back up. And it was just so funny to me because I already knew this about the Celtic symbol of the Holy Spirit was the wild goose. Can I just tell you, the Holy Spirit in your life can get pulled under and he'll pop right back up. If you have gale force winds blowing, can I just tell you the Holy Spirit is not fragile. Sometimes he's gentle and peaceful. He is a dove. But I want to tell you, you need to know him as a wild goose too. Like the Celts. I don't care if you like this art, don't like this art, but the symbolism is worth it. Early Christians had an appreciation for the goose's unexpected interventions and saw the goose as a fitting symbol for the Holy Spirit. Uh, Well before Shakespeare wrote of the wild goose chase, did you know he is the one that made that famous? Believers saw the noble goose as a symbol. Whereas the dove has a reputation for gentleness and calmness, a wild goose will attack if it feels threatened. It's wild and untamed. In the same way, the Celtic believers in the British Isles believe the Holy Spirit is unpredictable 
upsetting the status quo, and leading people toward a new adventure with God. Jesus didn't redeem us and send the Holy Spirit to us just to lead us gingerly on the path of safety, but to have this beautiful wild one lead us boldly striding in the way of the brave. That ties in with last week when we talked about the Holy Spirit making you brave. When we follow the Holy Spirit, we open our lives up to his life-giving, kingdom-furthering, and God-glorifying adventures. They, they believed that the picture painted by the wild goose was untamable, a dynamic person represented by a dove, but also by blazing fire and shredding wind, glorious and joyful and penetrating, just, well, uncontrollable. They use the wild goose as a constant reminder that this static world of the material everywhere intersects with the dynamic world of the spirit in a supernatural way. They weren't dualist. They were like, the spirit's everywhere. We don't have to get in the spirit. We are in the spirit. We just need to live like it. He's not segmented away. We don't have to go, oh, I'm tuning into you. We need to develop the sense that he's redeemed all things back to himself and we walk in that fullness. Why do you need him as a wild goose? Is it just so we can have goosebumps in church? No, my friend. It's because the enemy's offering you a wild adventure of his kind. Have you noticed the enemy's not just going, I want to be a dove. Now, can you handle this trial? The enemy's not being gentle with you, is he? Has this pandemic been gentle? No. You need a wild goose because you need to know the enemy's got nothing on God. God is the originator of boldness, bravery, fire, life, dynamism. He can come gently. Nobody's going to steal that from you today. Fear not. And I'm not talking about wildness in the flesh either. Because the church has seen that and it doesn't do anything. For anybody. But I am telling you, why do you need a wild goose as well as a dove? Because life hadn't afforded you calm. Life is throwing things at you. You need to know your adventure in responding to life can far exceed the obstacle course the enemy had planned. Here's a poem that a A modern writer who's seeking to capture this kind of spirit wrote about the wild goose. He said, Great spirit, wild goose of the Almighty, be my eye in the dark places. Be my flight in the trap places. Be my host in the wild places. Be my brood in the barren places. Be my formation in the lost places. Now, another thing that the Celtic Christians did, this is called a coracle, and this is a boat. You can see it only has room for one. It's a primitive, lightweight boat made of grasses and weeds and made waterproof with, I think, at some point they used tar. It dates back to pre-Roman times. It's designed to be carried on the person's back so they can walk on land and then get to the water. It's vulnerable yet small enough to respond and flow with its environment. Brendan and Columba and these famous Celtic saints that evangelized Europe used these coracles to get around. But there's another feature of Celtic monasticism that they call peregrinatio, which is Irish monks would set out in a coracle and not use the oar and simply let the wind take them, and this was what they called it, Take them to the place of their resurrection. Isn't that amazing? They would just set out and, and not refuse to use the oar, pray, and say, take me to the place of my resurrection. And that is how they conducted evangelism. They partnered with the wind, and in that day, that was a big deal. The peregrinatio means called to wonder for the love of God. It was a specific pilgrimage. I think that's beautiful. Today, this represents, we don't, you don't need to go get a coracle 
Today, this represents willingness to set aside our own agenda to follow God's leading. God, where in this profound practice, you can live like God is both destination and way, companion and guiding force. God is in the call to the journey, the unfolding of the journey, and greets us at the end of the journey. You don't need a coracle, but you might need to just believe God for divine appointments throughout your day. You might need to seek him rather than forcing your own agenda. Do you know, I literally, I do this when I come to church. I do not live out of a pastoral role of greet everyone. To me, my very body is a coracle, and I just think, when to the Holy Spirit, who do I need to connect with today? Instead of an agenda of who's feeling left out, I found it so much better if I just let the Holy Spirit blow this little coracle to wherever. Y'all are looking at me like I'm weird. Y'all are a lot, and I'm not a natural people person, so this is a big deal to me to learn how to greet people. And I, I just found out it, it's just so much better. But every day is like that, y'all. Every day is like that. It, instead of figuring it out and having my own agenda, I can hold my oar by my side, and then let his wind blow me to the place of my resurrection. <laughs> what if every time you submit your own agenda to his, you realize there really is a bit of a death in there, but he's, the winds are blowing you to the place of resurrection. And just the scripture for that, and the Celts love this scripture, and we should too, is John 3, 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is an earth wind map. So this is a freeze frame, but if you saw it online, it'd be in motion. And it shows you the real-time wind conditions all around the globe. It's updated every three hours and if you ever watched a wind map, they're absolutely mesmerizing. You just sit there and watch the eddies and the swirls and the turbulence. If God is at work like that in the natural, I mean, if the creation he made is moving and in motion like that and could take a coracle somewhere, how much more in the spirit is there something like this blowing? Do you believe the wind of the Holy Spirit's blowing over your life even when you aren't sure what it's doing? Because it is. It is. And there's currents and motion. And it's wild. It's wild. It's wild. This is a t-shirt I own. It came from the fine establishment known as Old Navy which is also where my jacket that I'm so proud of came from. The other day, I wore it to a gathering of Christian leaders not too far from here. And it's just a t-shirt that I liked, so I bought it. And a lady who I don't really know, out of nowhere, as I was getting my food at the luncheon, said, she looked at it and she said, Keep what wild? And I thought, I've never paused to even conceive of someone asking that question. <laughs> I thought, that's the beauty of it. A, you, it makes you think. What are we wanting to keep wild? But she asked it like, why would you want to keep anything wild? And so I'm, she's not here. I don't even know her name. But for you, this was a 15-second list I made. Keep what wild? Oh, I don't know, maybe your faith, your dreams, your vision, your experience of heaven's intervention. How about your experience of church? Keep what wild? I mean, honestly, I, could, I, I feel like I could have done this all night long. Do you know what I said when she said it to me? And I truly care about her, and I believe the Lord kept her in a bubble so I didn't offend her. I just walked away. 
She went, keep what wild? And I went, huh. And, <laughs> and I got my food. So just in case, here, I, here's what I've done. Maybe I thought, maybe we don't know what wild means. I've uh, curated a few meanings here that apply, okay? So here are a few meanings of wild. I guess I'm still answering her, but again, she'll never hear this. So she's watching. Who kn- she, she, I don't, I, I know, I know. Bless you. I'm so glad God shielded you from me. Anyway, <laughs> definition of wild, number one. These are the ones that I pulled out that actually apply. How about this? Living in a state of nature and not ordinarily tame or domesticated. Aren't you tired of overly domesticated church? I am. Of or relating to wild organisms, as in the wild state, not inhabited or cultivated, as in wild land. Now, you might think, well, no, but we do need to cultivate the realm of the spirit. We do, but not in, you can't tame it. You can't tame it. It's still going to be wild. Do you know, Tabitha Denny went on a drive to get her children to sleep one day. Has anyone ever gone in the car to get your children to fall asleep? She did that. That can be a coracle. And she didn't have an oar. She just was driving. And she saw this wild garden in somebody's front yard, wasn't it? And it spoke to her. She got a whole download from God. That's what I'm talking about. It's that kind of living open to God's intervention all the time. Um, not amenable to human, ha- human habitation or cultivation. You can't tame the Holy Spirit. Not amenable to human habitation or cultivation. It takes the Holy Spirit to know how to handle the Holy Spirit. Not subject to restraint or regulation. I didn't say you don't submit. I just said you're not subject to restraint or regulation. Emotionally overcome, as in while with grief or passionately eager or enthusiastic. You, I don't think I've ever trumped up fake enthusiasm just for the sake of seeming enthusiastic. It's come from that wildness inside. Marked by turbulent agitation. What's that? My heart turns inside me. What's my heart turns violently in my chest? We just sang it this morning. Going beyond normal or conventional bounds, like wild ideas or sensational. Don't you think the church ought to be making news of wild ideas and sensational things that come out of us? Wild business ideas, wild arts ideas, wild kingdom ideas. The Lake Country Christian School, for the first time, did a student-produced musical. That's a wild idea. And they put it together in how long? A month and a half, high school students. And if you know anything about musicals, it was a musical once. It's not easy music, it didn't seem to me. Uh, Emma right here played the lead. It was a transcendent moment. I'm not kidding. It was transcendent. That's the stuff I'm talking about. That's the seven, and, and at that musical, no one stood up and said, I would like to say that the wild goose did this. <laughs> but they're out there on the front lines of the kingdom blazing a trail in the arts that somebody's, I mean, that made history at that school. And somebody sat, sat up and take notice. That's what I'm talking about. Listen, we do need sensational signs and wonders, but I'm so equally excited about signs and wonders in business, in the arts, on Broadway. Uh, There's innovative signs and wonders. It's kingdom. Okay, indicative of strong passion, desire, emotion, as in a wild gleam of delight in his eyes, deviating from the intended or expected course. How's that? Having no basis in known or surmised fact. (laughs) God ever tell you to do anything that has no basis in known fact? That's wild. And then I left this one in as well. This refers to a playing card. Able to represent any card as designated by the holder. God can do that too. He tells you this is who you are, then there may be no other evidence, but if he says it, that's who you are. 
Now, there's a movement right now in the environmentalist uh, world called rewilding. And the point is they're now wanting to, I just put this book cover up there to give you an idea, The Radical New Science of Ecological Recovery. They're wanting to let nature heal itself. But sometimes they found you have to intervene. And so in 1995 in Yellowstone, they reintroduced wolves because the deer population had run over Yellow Yellowstone because hunters had shot all the wolves. What were they doing? That too was rewilding. The point I want to make to you today, do you think the church might need a little rewilding? Do we need to reintroduce a little bit of risk? Reintroduce a little bit of I don't have it figured out. Reintroduce, rewild, because because why do you rewild in nature? Because nature knows what to do. Can I tell you, the system of God, the economy of God, the kingdom of God knows what to do if you just set it free. And you quit trying to put your hands on it with human ideas and control it. Last week, Paul called it the retrofit. Retrofit, seismic retrofitting. He talked about it last week. He said, things that weren't built to withstand earthquakes, you can go back and re-engineer them to withstand. Can I just tell you, if your salvation was not equipped with enough wildness, God might need to retrofit you. If it was nice, neat, and sanitized... If your version of Jesus is nice, neat, and sanitized and only ever gentle, God wants to retrofit you and realize this thing is bigger than you knew. It's not a mere ticket to heaven. It's a way to live an amazing adventure of a life. The wild goose. Okay, I'm going to do one more quick thing, and then we're going to do something really special. I'm so impressed with my timing. Okay, there's a thing called flow state. Have you heard of it? In the 90s, it was a, it's kind of the science of human maximum performance. There really is a flow state, chemically, you get in in your brain, you're, you work better, you focus better, you perform better, you're more creative. Athletes call it the zone, but it's real. It's where you become one with the task you're doing. And in the 90s, everybody started talking about it and studying it. Uh, you lose, in flow state, you actually lose consciousness of time because you're so engrossed in what you're doing. Have you ever felt that? That many surgeons who do really intricate surgeries, they'll be four hours long, but the surgeon processes it as just a minute or two because they become one with the task. When athletes do it, we had two of our sons were middle linebackers, and sometimes when they'd get in the zone, it's like being in the spirit. You would see the play before the play happened. So how do you know a middle linebacker wants to get to the play? And there were a couple of times it's like the field goes away and you know go right there. You didn't see it in the natural. It's just that our brains are more amazing because God made them. We're actually, even, even in the natural, even without the Holy Spirit, we're wired to be really amazing. And flow state is real. I believe every bit of it when I read it. The uh, Croatian guy is the one who published the book. And I thought that makes total sense. I believe we get in flow state during worship. I believe when we're lost in worship, that's what's happened. Also, by the way, if you ever drive somewhere and all of a sudden you go, how did I get here? And you don't remember, make it, but it's something you knew. That's flow state too. Okay, so look at this. Just a couple of, give me a couple of minutes. This is flow state explained. On this graph, you have challenge on that axis. On this axis, you have skill, okay? The challenge and your skill level. If you have too much challenge and not enough skill, what are you? You ever been there? The challenge is too big and I don't feel up for it. Anxiety. However, if you have all the skill and you're not challenged, where do you live? Boredom. I hate boredom. But flow state is when you are properly challenged but also adequately skilled. And that's when you perform at your best. So I've always said that skill is grace, 
And the more you live, you find out what all God's put in you to skill you with living. Grace has given you all you need, but we're increasingly find about, finding out about it. But the challenge is faith. Just because I know I have it doesn't mean I've stepped out and walked it out. See what I mean? So if you ever get bored with your Christianity because you know who you are in Christ, man, it's all good. The Holy Spirit coaches you into a challenge to get you back in flow state. However, most people live down here because we don't have revelation of grace. We're trying to change that at this church, by the way. We're out to change that axis. Most people just push each other down the challenge axis and go try harder, repent better, <laughs> bite something off bigger. What, they live in Christian anxiety. That's not God. There is a flow state for you where grace and faith partner for your maximum performance. And I want to say that is the dove and the wild goose. So the dove's like, you got it. You can do it. So much inside you. In fact, you don't even need to try because I've done it for you. However... If all you do is sit at home and say that, there's a wild goose that goes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There's a wild goose that comes knocking on your door and says, you were made for more than this. You were made to not just navel gaze, although meditating is everything, unexplored meditating on the things of God. However... There are some things that only come alive in the middle of the challenge. Same grace, you had it all along, but the challenge activates it. Are you open to the wild goose? I'm going to ask the team from England to come join me on stage, and we're going to close something really special. So this is Sam and Kylie Brownback, Tab and Dom Demi, and my husband Paul. What are you doing, Paul? <laughs> he was he was going off wild goose over there. Okay, so, and they're going to help me tell this story. I have a few slides, but you guys just, if I miss a fact, especially you with the building material thing that Pete shared with you. Okay, so first of all, this is Bardney Abbey in England. Now, I know you're looking at that, and you're thinking, I see no abbey. That's because, do you see the mounds? Those were the columns of the abbey. And in England, there are so many ruins of abbeys and monasteries that when they can't excavate them fully, they just rebury them so they won't disintegrate. And so that is Bardney Abbey. Paul and I were there years ago. In many ways, this, this church was named from one of those trips. There you can see some of the stones that are still out there. Bardney Abbey was founded in 697, all kinds of stories of signs, wonders, miracles. It was the real deal. Took in, took in travelers. They'd stay there, have their lives changed. Grew crops. <laughs> I think they made beer, probably. Um, not sure about that part. Anyway, it was a vibrant abbey um, from 697. Then in 1087... It was refounded. Oh, the, the Danes raided it, and it was torn down. But in 1087, it was refounded, and it was up and running again. More stories, more miracles, the real thing, church. In 1537, King Henry VIII was breaking away because he wanted a divorce. You remember the story. So he ordered the dissolution of all the abbeys and monasteries in England except a few that he kept for homes and gave them to nobles. Over 800 monasteries were demolished. It was one of the most ruthless acts in all history. Bardney was one of them, totally demolished to the ground. So when they did that, here's a quote, after the dissolution, the locals took the attitude that they had first dibs on all the building materials. So here are massive stone columns raised to the ground by the orders of the king, and the locals just went, 
Thank you very much. I'll go get a cart and drag that to my house. So, this is also in Bardney in the shadow of that abbey. This is Pete Atkins, and there you see Paul with a cup of tea in his hand. And there you see Dom behind him taking pictures. And we are at his house. Pete is a church leader. He's, he actually, for years, he was a physician as he led church, and then he gave himself full-time to church leading. He's, he's a man of great stature in the kingdom. But now he's bought a barn, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute because when you think barn, you aren't thinking this barn. Um, he bought this barn, and they've remodeled it to be a house that takes in weary pioneering people. It's a house of refuge. It's a house for leaders. It's a house for safety. It's called the House of Lindisfarne, and it's a house of prayer and presence. And we've visited it many times. We stayed in it, but we took all of them with us. And so here's the garden. Uh, Pastor Tabitha has a real connection to that garden. And then I don't know who took this. Sam, did you take that? Okay. I think, yeah, Tab. That one I took. Oh, did you? That was this time? Okay. Yeah, so this, they, it, it, this is the barn. <laughs> That's the barn. And so in one of the windows on the other side, it looks directly out. And so that, from that window is where I took this one. But framed in their house next to that window is this photo. So that's theirs. And I took a photo of a photo. Okay. It's a, that's a photo of a photo. Thank you for doing that. Because that's the only place we see the barn. So now you see that's not just a... That's a... And so um, here is a picture. Ignore the left for a minute. Here's a picture of the prayer room inside that barn. We got to watch it when Paul and I, they first bought it was one of our first times over there, and believe me, it was derelict. Like, it, you couldn't have, this was not what it looked like. This is the prayer room. Dom, do you, can you remember some, anything about the beams? So, he, he said that it was like the 12th century or something like that. It's when they went and they actually had the, um, the trees tested, which I can't remember what that's called right now. Carbon dating? Yeah, that's right, right? Or, or the rings. Right. So um, they, could, they told, they could figure out when they were actually cut. He said it was like the fall of 13, yeah. something like 1300, something like that. Um, but all of the beams and everything there, and then also upstairs, um, all the trusses were from that. Um, and they left them exposed. They built, obviously, they built an actual um, a different roof over the top of it that's structural and left all that exposed so that you can see it. Um, but then the, go ahead. So the two, the ceiling over on this side, the two areas that are darker, they left that exposed. Everything else has sheetrock over it, but they left that exposed so you can see like the 13th, yeah, yeah, 12th century concrete. And it was wild. Wild. And what's even wilder I would show you the whole house, but for time's sake, I'm just showing you the prayer room. But, um, okay, Paul, point right above you in the prayer room to the, no, thank, Dom, thank you. Oh. <laughs> he was, now I'm kind of scared, he's just doing, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, see that right there? That's this photo, and what that is, what you're looking at, you can see Sam's feet up there, and Sam looking down into it in the reflection what that is, is when they dug down into the foundations, the foundations were composed of ruins of the abbey. So that is a light box, plexiglass over it, where you can see that the people that built this barn helped themselves to the ruins of the abbey and laid them all. And so you can actually see in those foundations, they, they went ahead and put a light box over it and uh, lit it up, and there's two more shots of it. So can you make that out? Yeah. Yeah, that, that one's like a decorative, ornate stone that was part of one of the pillars. So here's the story. That was already in place a few years ago. 
when Paul and I went to Barney Abbey. And Pete gave us, because there's all kinds of stones. In fact, I'll just show you. Here's some more. Uh, there's stones everywhere. I mean, I'm telling you, they ruined a giant, they just demolished a giant abbey. So people just went, thank you. And a lot of them ended up with Pete and Kath. Okay, so Pete and Kath have enough that they gave us one to bring home to the abbey. And if you've attended church a while here, you might remember we used to have this plexiglass podium. And for a while, it sat in the um, shelf of the plexiglass podium. Only here's the deal. We never labeled it. Can you see where I'm going with this? We never labeled it. We never made a plaque. We, just, we told everybody, and we went, ooh, we shouted for a few weeks. Isn't that what charismatics do? They just shout a few weeks. But we didn't do anything else. And then life happened, years happened, and one day somebody said, how many years between that time and when we discovered? The podium broke. We got a new podium. We remodeled a bunch of stuff. And one day somebody said, Where's that special stone we brought home from Bardney Abbey after which our church sort of took a name and, you know, and we, it's gone. So it's in somebody's trash. <laughs> it, it's gone. <laughs> it's ruined. <laughs> it's gone. So we knew that going into this trip, okay? And so I'm, it was all of us, but I'm going to say this woman had a specific wild goose-like fire. You may now go get your, do, do you need to help or is it? She's so, well, she's very passionate. <laughs> okay, bring it out here and then, okay, now look how happy she is. Right? That's about how big the elephant Yeah, yeah, that's so cute. This is the one we brought. <laughs> Did we show you the stones? Yeah. 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 So, um, no, I want to hold it. Okay. It. That's what I'm telling you. We got a wild goose on our hands. Um, Pastor Paul found this in the yard because he had, like, given us, he had set aside, um, Pete had set aside, like, four of them for us to look through because we told him we needed to take some back because we lost ours. Um, <laughs> silly American. I kept saying, the cleaning person got rid of it. And I was like, oh, there was no cleaning person. It, we're, just, we're just dumb. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Pastor Paul saw this one in their garden because they have all kinds of stones in their garden. Um, so he saw this one, and it has the original, like, shaving, like, corn or chisel. I don't know the words. Um, and then this one? No. This side is original markings as well. And then there's mortar on the bottom, original mortar um, and etchings on this side as well. One of them's from a circular saw, but I don't know which one. I can't. Well, and what's cool about that? What's cool about that is he was, he, Pete kept showing us. I'm going to go ahead and put this scripture up here. He'd say, he wanted us to be real clear. Now, this mark is modern, but this is ancient. And I love that because Matthew 13, 52 says, Every scribe instructing concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. And I love that they had things done to them. And then here we are bringing them to this metal building. Yeah. And so I picked it up and I started crying yeah. like actual big tears. <laughs> and me and Paul were sitting there like I asked him, I was like, can I bring this one? And he goes, uh, I mean, you could tell he was like, I want to say yes, but how? And so I said, what if we go buy a suitcase and I can wrap it in a blanket and we can check it. I'll pay for it to be checked. We just got to get it home. And then Pete's son walked out and he goes, are you crying? <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm having a whole moment. But this one won't get lost, probably. And we did just, well, two things about that. Thank you for clapping. No, two things about that. You, you can put it, you can do whatever you want. Except none of you take that. Okay. <laughs> Two things about that is, one, like even the non-hype-oriented um, Brits put it in a shadow box. So we learned a little lesson. You should, like, display it with a plaque or something. <laughs> uh, 
But the bigger lesson, and that's why I called them all up here, for me, the bigger lesson was I really felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, Crane, what you did wrong before is it was your generation. Not wrong. It's just where you were at. It was your generation participating. But this time, this generation. It's so right. Listen, it's just a stone. But you can see it's about ancient and modern. And it's wild, man. I mean, we did buy a suitcase. We did wrap it in a blanket. We did check that bag. I don't know what the scanners thought, Christoph. I'm sure they've seen rocks before. They did not weigh that suitcase. It's not light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were. We were. Well, it's it's only fifty to uh, leave here to go there, and so. Tabitha and I both were at like 48.549. And so then on the way back, it was 70 pounds. Was there a one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Increased the weight. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So, but, the, but it just really struck me how prophetic it is that it's one thing for you to launch out and go, this is the will of God. It's another thing for you to take the next generation by the hand and say, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? And so <laughs> all, all of us on this trip, Tab said it, it was a roots trip. But there was something about the way they accessed it. And again, I want to say to you, if you're here and you relate to their age group, it's you too. Will you let them represent you as you're sitting out there? Because I believe that it's just a stone, but I believe we're going to get our legacy right. And this whole thing, Paul and I have been birthing a thing in the Abbey all these years. I mean, it's not the first time I talked about Celtic Christianity. I've been raving about all this stuff forever. But it's different now because it's taken hold beyond us in a generation coming. Not that it hasn't before. It's just a new season. And I believe it's going to take hold all across. And we're on a, we're in a, what's that thing called? Second naivety where you you know you can go through a thing in life where everything's new again so if you've been around a while I believe it's time to rediscover some of your roots if you're up and coming I believe it's time to connect in hard and 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 also we're going to build a case for it anybody else want to anybody have anything you want to add before I'm going to hand it to Paul but Awesome. So much to say. Real quick, Michelle, did you have something? It's a pillar that could be a cornerstone. We'll call it a cornerstone. Amen. Say amen. Amen. So, so be it. Also, just one, you say, why, why, would you do, why would you do that? Well, for one thing, when the Israelites crossed the Jordan, the Lord gave them instructions, take stones out of the river, and when you get to the other side, build a monument so that you can tell your children and your children's children about the things that the Lord has done as a memorial so you tell the story so that they don't forget the supernatural divine intervention of our God who makes a way where there is no way. And so they, are, they truly are memorial stones to tell the story. I mean, we're doing our partner party next week but you've gotten a big piece of our identity of why we're called the Abbey. It's be, it predates America. It predates, it goes back um, all the way to the foundations of Christianity when the gospel was being sent out around the globe by the wild goose and the dove, if you will, by the wild goose to bring fire and anointing and signs and wonders across the globe and we we are the continuation of that 
And we continue to send out. It's why we do missions today. So it's that whole vision. I just want to add real quick, too. I feel like there's a word here that for anybody that feels like something's lost, we lost we lost an ancient stone, y'all. I mean, it went in the dumpster, and God restored it better. And I feel like there's a word. If you feel like dreams, visions, whatever it is has been lost, that, yeah, worship team, thank you for coming. That was perfect instinct right there. Um, that there is a restoration anointing. There was one Sunday, Tab texted me. Uh, I was getting ready to come to church. It was a Sunday morning. She texted me, we, we found the stone. This is long before we went to England. And I got here, and I said, you're kidding. And she was like, no. She and Naomi were sure they'd found the stone. Did you do that? Oh, I did <laughs> They sent me a picture, and I said, I think that is maybe it, yes. Well, I didn't know that, and I, we walked in, and I went, oh, I'm so sorry. That's not it. Like, I just, I just thought, I can't pretend, you know. It was used as a doorstop, so she thought. <laughs> but there's restoration. So you never know. Scott, do you have something? Yeah, somebody stand up and just begin to praise God. Hallelujah. Do it again, Lord. Again and again and again. Lord, send the wild goose. Lord, we say yes. We give you our yes to new adventures. Just begin to give him your yes right now. Say yes to new adventures. Say yes to wherever he wants to lead you. That you are willing to get in your coracle, whatever that looks like. It might be your job right now. It might be your vehicle. And let the wind of the Holy Spirit drive you to divine appointments and divine connections. Hallelujah. Christoph, you, you know that you're not a pilot by accident. Your desire for your desire to be an airline pilot is a desire for adventure. And he has set up for you divine appointments, divine connections around the globe in every flight, people you meet, and places you go. Divine appointments are awaiting you, and the adventure is just beginning. You're about to embark on greater adventures. You and you as a couple, both you and Kelly, are about to get your hands dirty in the work of the kingdom to a new degree and a new, a new dimension, going new places. I just see travel, 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 not just, in, not just as work, but travel in ministry, travel in opportunity, and you're, you're going to be blown away as in, in more than one way. Hallelujah. You're going to be blown away by how he blows you away to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody, just lift our voice. Let's just begin to worship him. Let's give him our yes. Oh, the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh, the earth will shout. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh, the earth will shout. 
the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing service today. We are so thankful for you, and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news, as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.